well being here. I realize that for some of you all, you chose to be in this presentation about art styles instead of getting some suggestions about how to get a job. So I appreciate you being here instead of in the room next door. Hopefully, uh, this might help you with your visual design career. Uh, this presentation is called Elements of Style, Understanding Art Styles in Games, which I find to be a relatively underserved topic in conferences. We talk a lot about fun and metrics and this and that. I love talking about why games look the way they do, why we are compelled to play those games. And I hope when we're done here today, you'll have a better understanding about how you're interacting with games and how we can talk about the visual design of games. Um, my name is Greg Grimsby, and I teach at George Mason University in the game design program there. This is my Gloomhaven character sheet. Gloomhaven players? Yeah. Yeah. We were in the non-digital space, so I knew there was going to be a tail off there. Um, so I just kind of did my thing, and I photoshopped a character board from that board game to look like me, and there's some stats there uh, that basically say I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, these are some of the games that I've worked on, just so you have a sense of both my pedigree, but also perhaps my sensibilities that frame my point of view. Uh, this is an animated logo for my board game design company, Ogre Crossing Games. Uh, these are some of the board games that I uh, either have published or am in the process of publishing right now. You know, Pet Shop, Ogre's Dinner, The Maze, and the list goes on. So I am both a game designer, I'm an art director, I'm a 3D artist, I'm an animator. When you're as old as me, you've done probably everything. So here's some quick takeaways. I apologize, this is gonna be fast. I wanted to give you so much wisdom, so much information, so much inspiration that I'm gonna go at a pretty quick clip, but I hope in that speed some of this still sticks. Um, so here are the takeaways that we're going to have today, I hope. We'll um, understand the elements that define an art style. We'll understand how an art style can inspire your players and build you an audience. Quick show of hands, if you've ever bought a game just because of the way it looked. Awesome. I think it would be maybe more informing to say, raise your hand if you have never done that. Visuals, <laughs> there you go. Visuals in general compel us. They can tell a story. They communicate the mood and tone. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll understand how your visual design can support gameplay. There's going to be some recurring themes in this, which I'm not going to necessarily hit on all of these and discreetly call these out, but these are going to be undercurrents. Uh, so pay attention to these. Um, inspiration from other media is critical, and that can also include historical art. Some folks did some paintings, and they're old, and they're still really good paintings for a reason. Clarity is king or queen. Noise control is important. Contrast is a powerful tool. We'll talk about focus, visual hierarchy, scene depth, and for extra credit, the power of gradients. Because gradients are awesome. Right? Gradients are awesome. So what is an art style? It's the emphasis of visual elements to achieve your visual goals. What are some of these qualities, some of these elements? And we'll come back to those goals. I didn't mean to leave that kind of hanging there. What are some of these visual qualities that we can control? Well, you have this very traditional art elements, color, line, value, shape, form. There are others that are more informing in a traditional 2D art world that I have culled. But these are really awesome art elements and powerful ones. And we have these holistic qualities that cast across those art elements, such as abstraction, reduction, and realism. Oftentimes, when we engage with the game visually or 
talking about it, you might say, this game is realistic, or this game is cartoony and ironic. So that's on that continuum of abstraction to realism. Back to the goals. What are the goals for your art style? Number one, you have to connect to your audience. You want your game to get noticed. You want your visual design to inspire your game design. That one's kind of tough. But if you've been in game development long enough, you'll understand that other people in your team can be absolutely inspired by your visual design. Creature designs, world design, any previs that you produce can inspire and affect your game design. And you want to elevate your gameplay and support your gameplay. All right, the race continues. Connecting to your audience. This asks a very basic question. Who is your audience? And that's a question that maybe we don't always have a firm answer on when we, when we begin a game development project. Often it might be, I'm making this game because I think it will be cool. Especially if you're students. You just make something that you think is evocative and fun. But not thinking about what your audience is besides just passing that test of is this fun, is this fun, is this fun. But who is it fun to? And this is not talk about fun, talk about visuals. But you must connect to your audience visually. Let's start with a hypothetical game. Let's say you're making a game about sushi. You have some choices about your visual design right there. So on the image on the left, I've taken a photograph of, or taken from the internet, of sushi. And maybe this is the way your game could look, right? We go to the restaurant and we get this photo men menu of the different sushi and we're like, I remember that one, that one tasted good, that one was kind of gross, and you're just kind of going off of that mapping of the visuals to the, to the photograph. And this could work. We could put a visual like that in your game, in your digital game or your board game, and it might function. But then here on the right, we have a version of that where we have done hand-drawn sushi with vector art, and we pull out noise. There's an idea of noise control, and as artists, we ultimately are deciding what details are important, what communicates the essence of a thing. Everything else is potentially just distraction or lack of legibility. So here in the stylized version of our sushi, we get clean gradients of the seaweed wrap, we get simpler shapes, and because this is based on vector art, every little detail takes time for the artist. And so they have to ask themselves, am I gonna make 20 different little rice shapes? And maybe they go, no, this looks like rice now. I've nailed it, I'm good. And so we get an alignment between this is quicker for me to do and I don't need all that detail. Then we have Sushi Go. Have you played Sushi Go? All right, I need more board gamers in here. Um, this is just adorable. I mean, we take that idea of simplified shapes and gradients and getting rid of noise, and we put smiley faces on our sushi, and all of a sudden, it just becomes really adorable. Back to our audience. The first photo, uh, photographic face game might speak to a more general audience. This book speaks to families. This speaks to a younger audience. This game uh, is really popular and it made a couple different versions of it. So we align ourselves and our visual style to our target audience. So these are some questions we have to ask ourselves. What is the age of your audience? What is the weight of game that they enjoy? And what other media do they enjoy? What board games do they like? What digital games do they like? What movies do they enjoy? Are they watching lots of Disney movies? Are they watching lots of um, MCU game, 
of MCU movies. So you would kind of align yourself to their uh, things they like and, and those other forms of media that they consume. So list of things that define your audience. Once you attract your target audience, hopefully your art style is going to immerse them in mood and it's gonna support the theme and get them excited to play. When these cards come out, people just smile. That is very effective. Now my, the takeaway here is to put smiling faces on all your art. In this case, it's really effective. Let's look at some other examples of how we could approach this. Here we have two zombie crushing games. We have Zombicide and we have Zombie Kids. These are both about killing zombies, but different target audiences, different ages. And so we have in the image on the left here, we have um, reds and blacks. It's a slightly lower key image. We'll talk about that more later. Then we have a more high key image here on the right, brighter colors, whites, light colors. But then the content changes also. But independent of the content changes where we swap out water blasters for machine guns, there are all the visual design choices that also align to our target audience. We also have the goal of being aspirational. So I'm gonna show my age here a little bit. Um, does anyone know? Who knows what this game is from? What, what game this is? Wow. Maybe you guess? A little close. You're so close, I can give you partial credit. Yes? It is in the Dragonlance universe. This is from the Gold Box series of RPGs. Um, I had a date here, it's going off my slide, but this is a really old game. This is the sprite based game. The left image is the box art. This is the idea of aspirational visual design. It's definitely uh, evident in box product games and in board games, where the theater of the mind is crucial. RPGs as well, any RPG players in here? Okay, awesome. More than board games. So your, your RPG has very few opportunities to visually storytell to you in the products, because most of this is going on in your head. You might have a couple of books that are the RPG rule books, and there might be a monster manual, but a lot of the visual work is here from things that you have seen and the way your game master describes stuff. But this is the aspirational of visual design, where we have an illustration that stands in for what really they see on the screen, what they see on their cards, but in their mind they're thinking, I'm going to kill dragons, I kick ass. That's aspirational. Another example is the Spider-Man game here. And IP work very effectively in this way because often we have a character in that IP that we love the idea of playing that character. We aspire to be that character. And so the game's goal visually is to transport us into that role-playing aspirational experience. It's a little bit of wish fulfillment in that regard. And this makes the game more of a simulation in some ways. We want to transport and to simulate so that some of them, when they play the Spider-Man game, they go, this is what it must feel like to web sling through a city. And it's awesome. But we could make some other visual design choices. We could decide to stylize this and do this more like in the Spideyverse uh, movie, where it was more cartoony, we had halftone fields. It could still transport you and be an amazing game, but there they are shifting away from the power of simulation, and they're shifting more to more narrative beats. So realism does tend to lead itself to certain kinds of simulation. You want your art style to get you noticed. Uh, so I'm gonna bring up the idea of the strange attractor. The strange attractor is a blend of things that you know, things you are familiar with, with something that is novel, something that is unique, 
or you're doing a combination of old things in a new way. So, you know, 80 20, it's a fun rule, so why not? 80% familiar and 20% novel. And I think if you are a concept artist, this is something that you uh, think about all the time. If you do a design that is 100% novel, I don't know what it looks like. <laughs> I don't know how it communicates what that warrior is or what that landscape is. Even an alien world like No Man's Sky still need a structure and anatomy of that which we understand. That's the 80%. The novelty is how quick can we play with forms and shapes to do something that is interesting, a new combination. Uh, so this is Cuphead. Any Cuphead players? Um, I love how they went like whole hog on this art style. I can't imagine the amount of labor and love that went into this. I do believe the art style inspired the artists and the designers. Like, everyone was all in, and their visual look absolutely drove that team. So this is an example of that. This is also an example of something that is sort of novel in that we take something old and retro, and we take it and put it in the platformer, and so we get a new experience. Whether that's 80-20, I don't know, but it's an example of new combination. And this game stands out. It really does. When you play this game or you see this game, uh, there's not much like it in the market. Uh, so this is Enter the Dungeon, something new, something old, or at least a novel combination. We take the idea of the dungeon crawler, dungeons, treasure chests, but we swap out elves and orcs, put in guns and bullets, and that's a novel combination. And once you decide that we're going to do guns and bullets, they still had a choice about the art style. They could have gone more realistic, detailed, but they decided they wanted to have the sprites, because those would be endearing, and they can exaggerate. And I, I would imagine as soon as they sketched one of those bullet characters, they're all in. They're all in on this art style, because it has character, it stands out, and the retro pixel art style, it's pretty popular right now, so why not? So these are some examples from board game, and this is more about the idea of standing out. Uh, I cannot endorse if this game is good or bad. I'm assuming it's probably pretty bad, um, but this is Mr. Bacon's Big Adventure. And so we have something that looks like Candyland, perhaps, but it's about bacon. So who's your target audience on this? People who love bacon, I guess. Okay, um, another example of the novel. Um, Butts in Space, the card game. Um, and I know this is a good game because Amazon isn't mine. <laughs> I have not played it. If you were to walk past the shelf of a board game store and see that graphic, you will be noticed. Mostly based upon content, but it's also very contrasty, mostly black and white with some spot color. So that would tend to jump out at us. Also, all right, let's get into abstraction. Uh, so this graphic comes from Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics from 1993. And I really enjoyed this, even though that book is not about art style or art direction, this, this visual does communicate a lot in one slide. And that's the idea, we move from the photograph, which represents one person. We can start to reduce down detail simplify. We can take our form language and generalize it. And with each step, we represent potentially more and more things or people until we get all the way to the right where we have this, I was going to say smiley face, but it doesn't look that happy. We have a kind of neutral face, which can sort of represent almost everyone. And that's an example of abstraction. Uh, let's look at this at an example for a popular IP that's been visualized in many different media. So we have here um, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, which is a card game. And this is meant for people aged 13 and up. So we're going to have more adults playing this, and they'll play that with their older children. 
And so we have photographs of the actors and actresses. In the middle, we have a collectible card game, which skews for a younger audience. We get rid of the photographs, we bring in some drawings, and we uh, generalize this. And we no longer are specifically invoking the actors and actresses. Instead, we're trying to invoke what was written in the novels. And then we have the Funko Pop versions of the characters. So yes, we're switching in between different mediums, but you can see how we increase that abstraction. We go from a photograph representing one person, Daniel Radcliffe, then we go to a general depiction of the characters, but still those specific characters. We're still these specific characters, but we've stripped them down to the point where without a few visual cues, you almost could even lose their Harry Potterness. This is about as re reductive as we can get, but still recognizable. It's actually kind of amazing that you can take that simple of a shape and still communicate a very specific character. So abstraction doesn't necessarily need to, uh, to increase the general um, population that we're talking about. It can still be very specific, but all the other details are gone. Reductive art adds abstraction. Um, so the Bauhaus um, is a German form of expression and interior design and architectural design um, for over 100 years. And their design principle was reduction. And I love this term because it really helps us get in the mindset that we should consider reducing down things to its simplest effective core. Gosh a game designer, if we're a programmer, if we're an artist, do we at least know what that common core is for what we're doing? So here's lamps and tables and chairs, and they've been reduced down to providing function, but still very clean form. They've been reduced. So this is mini motorways, which is a really fun um, route building game, basically. Traffic management made fun. Um, it really is uh, fun and endearing. And let's just look at the next slide and we can contrast. Not fun, not legible. I don't want to play that. And I'm sure the developers never thought of that as their art style. At least I hope so, because it is too noisy. We don't have that clarity. We go back to what they actually did and this communicates mostly with shape and line. And let's go back to that idea of, of abstraction. So I think there might be like 30 houses in this version of, um, I think this is Los Angeles, or some part of it. There are more than 30 houses here. So we are abstracting on multiple levels. We're abstracting our visuals and reducing them down to simple shapes and lines but also we are standing in and proxying one house equals like a whole suburb. And that's, that's fine and that's amazing because we don't want to play this version with millions of houses. That gets closer to like SimCity and even those games still have to abstract and have stand-ins for more complex systems. Uh, this is Good Job, another example of using reduction in your visual design style. Notice more or less no texture. Depends on how you define texture, but uh, we don't have any sample carpeting or wallpaper. All the graphics are, cl are clean, their lines, their shapes, very legible. And the palette is also very controlled. We'll talk about color more later. But we are reducing, even the, the forms themselves are simplified. So you might expect to see more squares and more rectangles, but they have made everything very ergonomic and soft. And as a, for a visual scan of the scene, the soft edges actually allow us to read the scene better than if it was all a bunch of blocks and squares. Uh, this is Monument Valley, which won, won lots of awards for being a really, really beautiful game. And remember, gradients are awesome. Um, gradients are awesome because they allow you to um, communicate with color 
without just using a single color. So we can stand, we can have these gradients represent a sunset or dawn. Um, we can push and pull surfaces using gradients from light to dark or vice versa. So gradients are a really powerful way of using color simply into uh, simple shapes to still get legibility. So no texture, gradients, and we have very simple depiction of form. Um, the stairs are probably the busiest parts of this, but it was necessary to communicate that slope. And I guess they might have tried to use ramps, but I think ramps lose the ability to communicate, this is where I can climb up a level. But we all know the signifier of steps as I'm going up or down. And so it actually becomes not only architecture, it becomes a gameplay symbol for what you're doing in that space. Yes, a ramp would have been simpler, but this helps us to know we're going up and down. Back in board games, this is a board game called Unearth. And, hmm, looks a little familiar. Um, we have a lot of the same qualities. Gradients, simple forms, repetition of some of those shapes, um, and a controlled and limited color palette within each of these different cards and also on the cover. So abstraction is a tool for emphasizing qualities that your audience cares about. You get to play to the strength of your medium, whether it's the limited legibility of a card or it's your screen real estate on your phone where DPI is high, but we don't have a lot of visual space to look at. So lots of different strengths, two different mediums, and our visual design choices can play up to those strengths or weaknesses. All right, holistic qualities, realism and abstraction. Uh, so this is taken from the Matrix minigame in Unreal Engine 5. And if I were to show this to someone not familiar with what this is, it could possibly be interpreted as a photograph, or at least a photograph taken with a strange lens. And this is definitely in that realism side of the spectrum. But there are still some art style and visual design choices that are being applied here. Primarily, they are using color grading to make this match what they did in the movies. The movies had that green tint to give things kind of almost like this unnatural, slightly sickly um, uh, look. And we tend to desaturate the palette just a little bit also, so we don't want super bright colors in here. It's not a super bright, happy world. Still realistic, still somewhat photoreal, uh, photorealism, but we're making our art choices here. So this is Horizon uh, Forbidden West. Again, on that spectrum, we could say realistic. Um, it has a lot of detail. The lighting model that they're using here is trying to communicate and use real qualities of the lighting and shadow. Um, we're not simplifying forms. I mean, I think the hair on the avatar is probably like tens of thousands of polygons. So realism was important. Detail was important. I don't think you're going to confuse this with a photograph, however, as we shift on that continuum. Photograph, realism, real world. Now we're making more and more design choices in our visual field to say certain things and to forefront certain qualities. The warmth of the world, the sublime nature and the hugeness of the environment, almost like in some of your Hudson River School painters, um, the majesty of the environment. So we go back and forth between these two shots. This is from Journey, and we're back to Horizon Forbidden West. Very similar compositions, very different art style. Journey, another award-winning visual design, and we have a very similar picture plane. We have a character we focus in on in the foreground, and then go into the background with lots of fog. Fog is great. It gives us gradients. It allows us to push and pull things out of the ground plane. And it allows us to control focus and noise. Fog is an amazing way of controlling noise. And it's also a natural phenomenon called 
uh, aerial perspective. That which is at the distance is less contrasty and less saturated. So we can see that in play in both of these. Lots of contrast in the foreground rocks, and if you push back in the picture plane in the scene, less contrast. Um, yeah, lots of detail, apparently so much detail that we have facial hair on our avatar. So um, is that important detail? Well, um, I think it speaks to their dedication to detail and to the game feeling transporting and believable. And you can certainly take it this far if you wish to, although at some point it feels like it's more of a technical exercise, or we did this, look at that, awesome. I might reduce that down. All right, art elements, woo, speed this up. Line, color, shape, value, and form from our earlier slide. Let's look some, at some examples. Um, this is from a game called Hidden Folks. So this is a game about line. I love the way this game looks. Does it stand out in the marketplace? Yeah, head nodding is fine. Um, there aren't many games that are executing at this look, and so you're gonna stand out. It's uh, endearing, we have these small little characters, and they're performing everyday life actions um, it's what I might call quaint, almost nostalgia for the homestead in some ways. Um, we could put color in this, but as we put color into it, we start to no longer stand out in the market. We also tend to lose that feeling of, I'm in the back of, of class in, in high school, and I'm just doodling with my ink pen, and I'm not paying attention to my English teacher. It has that single artist doing what they love, communicating a nice, clean vision. So this is another shot from the same game with kind of zoomed out camera, lots of stuff going on. And if we start to put texture in here and color, you can imagine how the legibility on the scene, and legibility is so important, legibility, clarity, would start to go down. Color, maybe we had like a texture for the roof, then I, I start to have a hard time making sense of these things. So knowing they wanted this much detail, the line is really helpful for them. Another example of line, uh, this is Geometry Wars. You could argue line or shape, combination of the two, but you feel like the artists here are primarily thinking of things in terms of constructing shapes with line. And so they have glows on the line. So that's our first read are the lines and the shapes. Segue to shapes. Um, so this is Night in the Woods, where we have these cartoony kind of characters, reducted down characters, and no texture. This is gradient, and this is shape. Um, and you definitely can, and actually to the point where they're downplaying line. So we don't always have to have line and shape at the same time. Um, a lot of shape or communicating, even texture, communicating brick, so we know what surfaces the are, these are. Um, they also use a lot of bloom and glow, and you'll see those kinds of things used throughout some of these images where the, the goal is to soften edges. So when we put these uh, glows and blooms in, you can see it on the roof line in particular, it softens stuff and it also gives us some more harmony we blend this warm, the sunshine color into the roof line. This is Patapon. Uh, this is made by Pyramid and Japan Studio, and this is both shape and contrast. I love the contrast in this game. It's such a wonderful way of handling the picture plane. When we take this side view camera, we drop the environment ground down to black, and then we have color. So we're not just contrasting value. You can contrast pretty much all of the art elements. You can contrast your use of color, you can contrast your value, you can now contrast in shapes, pointy shapes, soft shapes, different feelings, so you're going to evoke with those. So here we have, well, pointy shapes and lines and like the weapons, and then we have uh, the creatures using primarily shape and form communicating to that black silhouette. Uh, we talked about many more ways already, so we'll go through that. This is Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time. Lots of gradients, I love my gradients. Um, 
here we have a combination of line and shape together. So what's that balancing act between line and shape? Line and shape can work very well together because shape doesn't always communicate enough. And we can use lines to help push and pull things off of the background. So if we, for instance, take the line work out of these rocks, then it becomes a little more difficult to read the faceting and read those planes and forms. So we put in some line work to help reinforce our forms. Uh, this is this room, which certainly is about a very specific shape, the spinny blade of death. And this is an interesting visual design because I've shown examples of very like exaggerated, condensed versions of these elements. But almost all games are going to have elements of shape and line and color. And those are really rare examples. So this is a lot of shape, practically no texture in the sense of communicating it via photography. Um, we communicate surfaces very simply with the context. Uh, we know that we use green here to communicate that sense of overgrowth, but those shapes are still pretty simple. Value, this is Limbo, a um, really beautiful and haunting game. It's a great example of just getting rid of color for the uh, experience and allowing you to push and pull out of black and white. And we'll get to some examples of this more later, the ones that we play. Um, we get some vignetting effect in the corner as we have black kind of creeping into the edges. Um, if you've played this game, what's, a, what's amazing as a tool for the designer, the gameplay designer, is how you can creep things in and out of the vignetting. Uh, and it gives the player that moment of indecision of whether that is a rope, or it's a tentacle, or it's some limb of a creature that's just going to murder them. Um, and that supports, and is a big part of the gameplay experience. And so the visual design choices to use value and black and white and allow them to do that amongst other choices. Uh, more examples of black and white, I'll kind of speed through this here because time. Um, Dr. Roboto, pure black and white. This is a card game called Escape uh, the Dark Castle. And here we are invoking illustrations like you might have gotten in an old Dungeons and Dragons rule book. Again, ink drawing. We could put color into this, but this game stands out. You can tell this game from Magic the Gathering very clearly. You can walk down your board game store and see this there, and it jumps out at you against all the color. I love color, by the way, but uh, there is a purpose for this kind of uh, distinct look. Okay, this is a high key image. High key images predominantly are light values. Here's the histogram, it's hard to see down here, but basically it's a uh, population ramp of what colors are here. This is a high key image, so it has low population of dark values. And this gives us a certain quality. It, it can feel very ethereal. Um, we might connotate this with ideas of afterlife or ghosts, that's ethereal. Um, it's very bright can be very inviting compared to low-key. We just saw an example of a low-key game. Here, your light sources really pop, and you have that vulnerability to push and pull out of the darkness. Here's a game that is a low-key game. All right? Uh, this is an inscription, and at least this part of the game, without any spoilers, and that was, um, this is probably uh, mostly a low-key game. High contrast, but dark, just the eyeballs kind of staring out at you. And if we did this more kind of even histogrammed or high key, we lose that quality. Uh, this is another character encounter in set game, and the histogram is still very dark. We can see more, but it's almost like we're painting with light. It's almost like the, the artists are starting with black dark scene and then they illuminate from there very intentionally to spotlight and give focus. 
All right, see, I don't hate color. I like color, it's awesome. Uh, so this is, got like four or five minutes left. Woo! Um, this is color and saturation. Um, we have Dead Cell versus Salt and Sanctuary, both side-scrolling games, fighting, characters, stuff. Uh, very different tone and mood. So we can see how our color choices are impacting how the player perceives our game. It's going to affect, one, the marketing side of things, how people look at your product and screenshots, but it's going to have an emotional impact in the game as well. So we tend to associate lots of colors and saturated colors with more toy and childlike qualities. So we have, again, smiley faces making everything better, and we have lots of colors, and they're very saturated, and I went through it quickly, but saturation is how much color there is, how strong the color is, full saturation versus gray. We pull out the color to get gray. That's your level of saturation. Um, but just because we have saturated color doesn't mean we're making a kid's game. Saturated color can be extremely powerful, but lots of saturated color can be overwhelming. It can be difficult to read the scene. And when we are selective about our color palette, we can communicate very specific colors for different zones. So we can have a color palette that is perhaps more sickly, yellows and greens, um, or we can have a color palette which is more complementary and really jarring, but there are a lot of colors that aren't in this scene and this is intentional. Uh, this is from Ori and this is also from uh, Ori. I think this is Willow Wisp expansion. Uh, what a beautiful game. Somewhat low key, we have a lot of dark areas and we are painting with light once again. That's definitely Willow of the Wisp. Speaking of color palettes, I had to make a joke about Quake. What's the joke about Quake? Brown, brown, brown. I think there are some technical reasons why Quake wound up being so brown, but it's still fun to poke at them. Uh, this is an illustration by Wayne Reynolds for Pathfinder, so you folks who play RPGs, maybe play this one, yay. Um, and we have a lot of warm tones. Uh, the cooler tones in here on the swords are still pushing towards the magenta side of cool as opposed to like a neutral blah gray. So we're getting some color casts here in the weapons. Again, a lot of colors we don't see. Fairly desaturated palette, and I just love this triangular composition. It's so amazing. Um, directs your eye right to the wedge of the heroes, the protagonists. Uh, this is a shot from my board game, Alien Pet Shop. Uh, this is for a target audience of 11 or up. And so here is my visual design cheat sheet for that. This is one part of my visual design board. So here is my color palette histogram, which I am a big fan of. We communicate color, not just with swatches. We've got some green, we've got some blue, that's our color palette for this level. That's not so useful. Tell me how often those colors exist. So this is saying that pink and blue are equal in their population in my game. But then we have a less amount of yellow, a less amount of green. So get more information from this way of communicating color than just color splotches. Spot color. Uh, this is spot color. This is used in super hot. So we go high key, white backgrounds. They're not important. They're really just traversal terrain for things to come at you or to block things. Your um, antagonists are going to be in that red and they read a lot of this shape. Their forms are very simplified. Mirror's Edge, kind of similar. We take the background, we push it to white, we push it to a high key, and we use spot color. And in this case, the spot color has game play function. Like we mentioned before, you can use color very specifically. And in fact, they have reserved color and said, we're using this color for this function, so you can't have it elsewhere. We're using red for things that you can grab or that you can parkour off of, so you don't get to put red anywhere else. So that's reserving color space, preserving spot color for gameplay functions. Uh, this is a card game, Gloom. 
and another example is about color black and white with colors to show you which suit of cards that you have. I have the purple cards, you have the red cards. Great example pulling from other media. So uh, we have Frank Miller's Sin City, we have a shot from the movie, we have a shot from the graphic novel, black and white with the spot color and we communicate vileness with that yellow. It's such a sick deep yellow. This could be a black and white comic book. But the injection of very specific use of spot color, um, it increases the narrative power of certain characters in certain moments. Um, color. So we have games that are almost grayscale. Uh, this is Hollow Knight. So um, there's a little bit of color tinting in here. Uh, this is again Salt and Sanctuary, fairly black and white, fairly functioning on Valley, but we do interject, interject some color. And a lot of cases this is done so that we can differentiate our, our levels. So we can have a level that's somewhat green and a level that's somewhat blue so the whole entire game space isn't the same color. We do need a break from that color, and there, there are emotional notes we might want to hit with these different colors. Uh, this game called Inside. A lot of side scrolling here. I guess maybe the side scrolling space is kind of innovating and pushing, or because they don't have a full 3D space and they have a very locked in camera, they have more control over things like shape. Noise control and clarity, and I'm going to have to zip through this. I apologize. Um, so the, the quick notes of this. Um, noise control and clarity, I think, is just so important here. Um, this is Hades, and we'll compare it to Diablo. Diablo 2 versus Hades. Both very successful games. This game is noisy. This game, I have a hard time visually parsing what I am seeing. I don't even know what's going on in the middle of that screen because it's noisy. But if you go back to Hades, there's a lot more clarity here. Wow, we get clarity, we get legibility, and we also get a look that's going to attract your audience. It doesn't mean I hate noise and I hate detail, but there are times when reducing down your detail is going to be powerful and effective. Because they're going for a comic book look here. So you want your art styles to support your gameplay, this is a pretty famous example, so I'll blow through this. This was the original book for Team Fortress 2, and they said, we can't read our character classes. I have no idea where the medic is. We need a different art style. And so um, Moby Frankie, um, who was their art director, came in and did this task where we use inspirations uh, from J.C. Leyendecker, and we accentuate form. We exaggerate the folds of cloth. We use gradients, and we produce silhouette-based character designs, which is what this slide's about. So we want legibility in our character silhouettes. That's something we did in Warhammer Online, which was an MMO, fighting, killing. Uh, we made sure that each of our races had a very specific silhouette, and that's what they did here. So your art style is fulfilling the gameplay need, and we have to be able to tell which character I'm engaging with. What is their threat to us? And to wrap up, inspiration from other media. Um, this is a card game called Parts on the right, and you can see the postcard art that this game was inspired by. It's peaceful, it's tranquil, um, Anyone who's seen these kinds of postcards is going to get that nostalgia effect. But even if they've never seen the cards there on um, the postcards, this is a very clean and inviting look. They could have used photographs. I don't think anyone would play it. Because this, again, allows us to control the composition and have that waterfall just perfectly framed. And I don't want to under downplay the impact of photography and all its artistry. You can do some amazing things in that space. But the people making board game art tend to be illustrators, not photographers. Um, more examples of inspiration from media. We talked about Cuphead already, and its inspiration 
in the uh, Bali symphonies and Mickey Mouse. And then back to Hades, clearly, pulling from Mike Mignola, uh, you, can, you see it almost like very specifically in the way that skulls are drawn. I think this was a promotional image that they produced, being inspired by comic books. So look at your graphic novels, look at movies, read books, as many visuals as you can kind of get in your head um, that's going to allow you to make better art and science choices. It's not all about Google. I'm out of breath. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have uh, a few minutes for questions, or, or are you kicking us out? Five minutes for questions? Okay. Any questions? Full clarity has been obtained, and clarity is important. art style, you want to find some examples that you also really like. So if you want to try something that looks more like what Hades did, you want to actually see if you can research what they referenced. You don't want to reference someone who's referencing something. Like you want to kind of dig down to the original source material. So look at the J.C. Landecker paintings. Um, look at Mike McDowell's work try to figure out the original source instead of translating a translation, which is like a bad photocopy. So find those true original source materials, and I'm a big proponent of copying the works of masters. So find the best painters, find the, art, the artists whose work you really enjoy, and you want to duplicate it to understand the mark making that was happening. So if you copy a masterwork painting, you're going to get a better understanding of the process, and you're going to walk away with an understanding of how they did it, and you'll be able to apply to some of that. You probably aren't a master, um, but you'll still walk away with um, some understanding. So if you're trying to explore different art styles, find those really great examples that you find are effective and evocative, find the original source material, and just try your best to replicate them. Um, your goal, of course, is not to become a carbon copy of someone else, but I think in that sampling, an awareness will happen, and perhaps you'll find a stylization, a treatment that you really enjoy you know, creating. So the question is, there can be a, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, there can be a skill gap in just raw execution of art style. And how would someone who has, who's still learning, still has a lot of drawing and studying to do, how would they try to jump or manage that skill gap so they could begin to effectively study art style? Unfortunately, there aren't really great shortcuts for some core competencies, um, being able to draw observationally, being able to do purposeful mark making. Uh, what does that mean, purposeful mark making? Like your, your hand and your, and your brain are, are like in sync, uh, and in different media you are able to create marks that you are controlling whether they are high energy marks, whether they are thick and thin marks, um, you're able to, to, to blend, so there's, there's that, plus the understanding of the medium. So I wish I could give you a, like, just do this and do this and do this. Um, however, in terms of the study of art style, hopefully, if you use some of the, the language that we use today, and deconstruct art styles down into their elements, 
that will at least help you to parse their decision making. So if you think about how they use color, you think about how they use line, you think about how they use shape, then you can make some explorations. And perhaps I would say, if you're interested in shape, find some great examples of shape. You can look at Picasso's work, which is basically about shape and abstraction. Um, find other examples of, of shape that you enjoy in modern media and just do some exploration. Like, say, I'm, I'm gonna design a simple, cute little dog with shapes. And try to keep it simple until you understand how shapes are working for you. There's a lot of, of like deconstructing down a complex art style which might look really difficult to do uh, into how it was made and then practice those different parts. But ultimately, there's, that, there's still definitely a skill. There's an execution in the medium of choice. And you do need to get to that level where you're, you're I keep saying the word mark making, but your ability to, to draw and execute is with intent and control. Like we've all seen people's portfolios, and it's very clear they don't have complete control over the medium yet, independently of their thought, uh, their thought process and their decision making. Um, I want to get maybe one or two more questions. Um, if you want to come up after afterwards, I'll see if I can come up with them. Uh, I will say that the uh, the color palettes that I pulled from those different images came from Adobe's website. The program is called Cooler. I'm pretty sure K U L E R, and it's really awesome. You can take an image, you can chuck it into the website, and it'll go. This is the color palette that they use, just based upon like the population histogram of colors. So that's a really powerful tool because it allows you to analyze an image and, and go, oh, yeah, those are the colors that they are using. So that's just one example of a very accessible tool that's that's helpful for artists. It's, it's, it's helpful when you're just going to kind of deconstruct down an image. Uh, other ones I'll have to think off the top of my head. Yes, you. Yeah, I'll restate the question. Um, the question is, to paraphrase, how can you mix up what you're doing visually to probably emphasize a moment or a level? Um, you have a sense of consistency, but you want to understand or how, know how you can break the rules in certain cases. Think of the question as what rules you break. Um, and I, what often you'll find is when you have a whole series of levels, you design what's called a color sprint. And that's basically colors that are assigned to different zones. And you can just, this can be done with just simple gestural paintings. It can be done with just taking images from Google. This is the, or you can use cooler. Um, but you have a color script for your level progression. And that's gonna give you a sense of how you have, you have used color. So with that mapping of your colors, then you can go, all right, final boss. Well, you can take a game that's part of it, like that's in black and white, and then for the final boss, do you want to have it have it in red, right? Like you've established the whole game is in black and white, and then you throw this use of red at the end, and it's going to be really striking. It might not work, but um, you, what you're doing is you're only changing one rule, right? Um, using a certain kind of shape language, like soft shape, soft shape, soft soft shapes and then the boss comes out and it's all like triangles and spikes, um, you've broken your rule temporal, temporarily for a very specific reason. So pick which rule you wanna break and visually and see if that aligns with whatever content you're trying to emphasize. Um, I need a timekeeper. <laughs> Go ahead, yep. Okay, the question is 
how efficient is it to, you said clash with art? In your own personal work, in your portfolio? Because it's a little different than in a game. I think we've established that your game should have consistency. Um, so ultimately, you want to get a job in the games business. And what tends to happen is you develop your portfolio, you have your concept art, you have your 3D models, and you probably don't have a whole lot of style. Um, the good news is depending upon what the job is, we're, we're not necessarily looking for a developed style because guess what? You have to match the style of my game. Um, so I, what I want to see is malleability. I want to see that you understand some of those core principles that we talked about. Um, that you have a good sense of line and render, and you have competency in your medium. Um, you could have a couple different style examples in your portfolio, and I, I would be intrigued by those. The only time that gets into a, a less useful area is if your content and your um, the medium that you're using is kind of really pigeonholed. I'll be more clear. I'm not super fond of brush portfolios, sorry folks, um, when all a person has is a bunch of high polygon ZBrush stuff and they haven't even gone through read apologize and stuck into a game. It's just like, I, I did some ZBrush stuff, right? I hate those portfolios because um, I don't get a sense of, okay, well, what can you draw, right? It's draw, drawing is still ultimately a, a super powerful indicator of can you communicate quickly and clearly and I could look at things like your proportions, I could look at things, do you understand anatomy? It might not matter in my game, but it, I, I do tend to look at it. Um, so I think that's an invitation to have a nice variety in your portfolio. Um, obviously quality still is king, right? You need to have decent stuff. So don't put in examples of you working on other styles if you really haven't done it well. I think that makes sense, but definitely don't put in variety for the sake of showing flexibility. Let's do one more uh, public question, and then if you have questions, we'll just break out, I guess. Yes, go ahead. styles reflect art historical looks. Um, I think some games more directly understand the relationship between what they're doing and art, art history. I think a, a knowledgeable art director absolutely understands and will try to connect back to art history because these problems have been already solved. Um, what looks good has, has already been tackled by artists for like thousands of years, and that's what allows us to get up and talk about line and shape and value and color. And we just can see different periods of artists working in these different levels of abstraction, like modern expressionism. We can see just amazing examples of emphasizing and de-emphasizing different visual qualities. So that's all there. I think it's an utter waste to not reference that amazing work of genius that's happened over the centuries. And it's certainly something that we can tend to do in our contemporary world is just to focus in on, like I was saying to someone over here about studying art style, you want to understand the original primary references. Um, understand that and copy that, not necessarily the modern regurgitation of it that's been replicated and, and changed um, and no longer represents that pure exploration into line. All right, thank you everybody, appreciate you.